All right, so again, um, thank you to Gershom and the organizers for letting me speak here and for a bunch of other things that I don't want to name right now because we have a talk. So I thought I'd begin with the talk, the talk with something kind of uh, we all understand, the number 10. So here's the number 10. All three pages of it. And, you know, um, Gershom and I had an exchange a couple of years ago about this particular number. Um, I, um, I sent out a, an email tongue-in-cheek to a group we're a part of saying, after all these years, I finally got my PhD and just now I understand the number 10, you know. And so there it is. And Gershom's response was, but isn't that 11? <laughs> so then uh, I realized, well, maybe I have a little bit more to learn. And so there it is. So, so that's kind of a teaser. Um, here, so would, would, uh, is this big enough? Can you see it, um, the slides? Let's see. Let's make this go away. How's that? Um, I, um, I'll, I'll say a, a bit about um, where I work. I work at a company with Baird Rock with one of the organizers, Rick Meinrich. Um, we work in anti-money laundering and I'm a researcher for them. Um, that's, that is what that says. Okay, so, okay, so, start with philosophy of what a set is. So in reality, there's a bunch of things that deserve to be called a set theory. Today, we're going to concentrate on a particular theory for most, car, for most part called ZFC, or that stands for Zermelo Frankel with choice. And it's named after people, so perhaps not the most descriptive name, but that's what it's called, so ZFC. And, but if you know anything about the history of um, these things, it's a bit like having different geometries. You know, you have flat Euclidean geometry and maybe curved geometry, and you, there are questions about whether or not the parallel hypothesis holds in these or not. And much the same way, you have different set theories. Um, so here's the question. Can you, is this going through okay, by the way? Um, what is a set? Well, my favorite definition, not really a definition, is it's a thing with stuff in it. So, well, okay, so what are the things and what are the stuff? What is the stuff? So it turns out that that only sort of matters. It's how, it's a little vague, but it doesn't matter that much because it's the term in that matters, how the things relate to one another. So, for instance, like point and line. In fact, point and line is literally an example because a point is on a line and a line can be thought of as a subset of the plane. So this is um, a pretty spot on analogy. So instead of defining it, let's define a class of theories that deserve to be called set theories. So a set theory, roughly speaking, is um, something where you have this epsilon relation, where you have one thing that is inside of another. So, so for instance, you have the set of um, all people named uh, Jack, just to pick something, and a particular instance of Jack is in that set. So that's an instance of a, so, so there's this epsilon relation. Now the reality is, is that this relation is not, um, Th that's a particular semantic meaning to that relation. It might actually have something very little to do with containment, but that's the semantics we endow with this. So sometimes the types of the containers and the contained are the same. Sometimes they can be different. Sometimes they can be multi-sorted. So this gives us a lot of flexibility in 
what a set can be. So here's a, a slightly different notion of a set. This says that a set can be something like um, some kind of aggregation of things of the same flavor. So, so in other words, there is some common property that defines all these objects in the set. So why not just define the set directly to be a predicate or a proposition? And the elements of the proposition or the set will, will be things for which this pro proposition are true. So that's um, a not slightly different notion. Now these are different notions because there's a tension between them. One of them is well-ordered, things that have some property in common and it's ordered and understandable. The other is just a thing. It's a bunch of stuff in it, right? So, so these are sort of ideologically two different uh, things. And what's a little surprising perhaps is that in, they're sort of the same in, in a way, but not always. So that, that's actually a very tricky thing, whether or not they're the same. And it has caused people some problems. Um, so there's some more tension. Um, did I? Oh, the solution to this tension is to say, OK, how do you consider these two to be the same? Well, one thing you can say is, well, if you have a predicate, you can consider the collection of all things that satisfy that predicate, right? But what if you have a set? Can you create a predicate that describes the set? Well, you can simply say, consider all x such that x is in that set is true. So there is a predicate, right? That, that describes that set, namely being in that set. So it's almost this little word game you play but it shows that they're equivalent, maybe. So, except there's trouble in paradise. There's this um, paradox. It's called Russell's paradox. And what it says is, well, what if you consider all the sets that do not contain themselves? Um, well, is this particular set an element of itself? If it is, then it's not, right? And if it's not, then it is. So maybe this approach of thinking these two things are the same isn't perfect and there's some wrinkles that you have to worry about. Very similar to the old Greek uh, barber's paradox. Um, um, how does it go? It says, um, the barber shaves all, the, all of those who do not shave themselves, so who shaves the barber? Um, I seem to have. Um, however, many people ignore this. Um, many people ignore this and deal with it anyway and use this as a guiding intuition and mathematicians particularly know to stay away from it, right? And don't do anything where you're going to have an obvious paradox and as long as you follow the rules and do things right, things are kind of okay and this gets you a certain amount. But on the other hand, you would like a system that is internally coherent and one that serves as a foundation for all of math. So that way you can um, be sure of the truth of things. So they wanted to create such a system. And Russell's paradox was quite a thorn in their side. Oh, dear. 
Okay, so here are our desires. We want a we want a theory that um, is a foundation for everything or almost everything, but that doesn't give us the, this nasty paradox, right? And we want it to be flexible enough to do all those things we want to do. Okay, so various set theories. Um, we're going to mention them, although we will concentrate on ZFC. So what can be a set theory? So we have a list of predicates, atomic lists, general lists, um, unordered atomic sets, ordered, unordered pure sets, any directed graph. So that's uh, just sort of a quick summary. Let's go through those. Well, we already saw how a predicate can be a set. And remember, to have a set theory, we need a, um, an epsilon relation, which I called in. So the question here is, is x in p? And you can see that it's just function application, right? So x is in p if p of x is true. So that's one set theory you can look at. Uh, atomic lists. So these are lists where your entries are some basic, come from some basic type, maybe an int or a character or a float, or even some strange um, thing you created. The point is it's just um, a heterogeneous list. And what does it mean for something to be in the list? Well, it has to be somewhere in the list. So here's the some sort of Haskell code that describes that. And something that I think just about um, anybody who knows the first thing about Haskell could write, so. Here are some lists. List one is one, two, three. List two, 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 three, one, one. So is list one equal to list two, by the way? Well, you'd all say no, right? Because obviously not. If we run, ooh, that was um, not the right thing, but we'll get false. They have the same elements, however, right? Just some are duplicated and in different orders. And so maybe there is a sense in which they are the same. And so maybe. But the answer depends on how we want to define equality. So you could define equality in a number of different ways. And for purposes of lists, we find it to be the two lists have the same size and each entry matches up the way you would expect. But we could consider other notions of equality. Um, so is uh, two on the list? Yeah. In two different ways, right? So two is contained in that list in two different ways. And this is called proof relevance. You can prove that two is an element of that by looking at the first or the second entry. So that is, so, 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 so there's um, general lists where instead of the um, atomic lists, you have lists that are of, uh, made of lists of lists of lists. And it has this recursive property. And it's very much the same. So what about the unordered atomic list? So that's the case where you have um, your, your sets are just, they're just like lists, except that A, it doesn't matter which order they are in, and duplicates don't count twice. So 
the way you could calculate this is sort them, sort them, um, and remove duplicates, and check for equality. So in this case, the two sets or lists will be the same if and only if they contain the same exact elements. Very different than the other way of thinking about lists. So what we did was we had these things called lists and we defined two different notions of equality. One is the one, the usual notion and one is this weaker notion. So we uh, performed an act of violence here, right? And the violence was that we destroyed a bunch of information. We took a quotient of, uh, of the object. We, um, we removed duplicates and we decided that those two sets on the other slide, 1, 2, 3, and 2, 2, 1, 3 were the same. So we squashed one down into a mere shadow of itself. And so this is um, a real act of violence. So of course, sometimes violence is justified, so don't go out and kill anybody. So here's an interlude, equivalence relations. So this is in some sense, you could argue what makes an equality relation an equality relation. So a thing should be equivalent to itself. If, two thing, if one thing is equivalent to the other, you would hope that the other is also equivalent to it. And if this and that are equivalent and that and the other are equivalent, you would hope that this is equivalent to the other, right? So any other notion of equality would be sort of bizarre. So, so, this is, so, so this is sort of what counts as a, um, a, a valid notion of equality. And you can actually choose different notions depending on what you want, and you can actually have different notions of equality coincide within the same discussion. Um, this is something that Gershom and some of the other Hasklers do all the time at the homotopy type theory group. That's a lot of what it's about, and taking that to its far-flung conclusions. So, yeah, so this is a slide explaining that point again, that these equivalence relations are notions of equality. Ah, but what is the most basic notion of equality? Um, it's that you, so one very basic notion is that this is equal to this, um, character by character, string by string. Actually, that is not the most basic notion. And the joke goes that um, there was this mathematician and he was uh, writing on the board something. The mathematician was rumored to be Grothendieck. Um, he was writing something on the board about some variety or something. And he had spec X. And then, um, then came the next lecture and he erased the spec X and he said, let Y equal spec X. And a student asked, hey, you already had spec X up there. Why did you rewrite it? And his answer is, there are different spec X's. <laughs> so maybe this isn't the most primitive notion possible, but it's pretty primitive in, for most people. So let us pretend that we have a fully formalized out of the box set theory and we already have the axioms and we know what it all means. Um, well, we have some script set S and we can actually form an equivalence relation on S. And what this does is it just takes your set X 
And if two things are equivalent, it just smashes them together into one object. And this is exactly the uh, act of violence from a few moments ago. And so this is the notion of the, of, um, the quotient. So, so you smash things together that are the same. And so there is, um, so, so this is a common pattern in math having to do with quotientings. And what you usually do is you form a set of these S1 through Sn such that each set is pairwise distinct and, and that the union of all of them is all of S. You can think of this as a group by, right? This is exactly a group by where each element of big S gets put in its proper bucket and each of the buckets are themselves the um, thing which is the quotient. So you think of the collection of all things which are equivalent as the element of the quotient set. So, that, so let me say that again. You have a big set and you want to quotient it by this relation and make a new set. Right, you can't just smash things together, you have to make it into a set. So what you do is you take all things that are equivalent, you bucket them in this way, and you consider the buckets themselves, this set of buckets, or this set of sets, to be the quotient. Does that, yes? Is it a partition? It is a partition, yeah, that's exactly it. So any, every partition gives rise to a, uh, an equivalence relation, and every equivalence relation gives rise to a partition. So there, um, so, so uh, an equivalence relation, you partition by things that are equivalent to each other, and a partition gives rise to the equivalence relation by saying two things are equivalent if they're in the same bucket. So, but uh, here's um, one thing. A common proof strategy in math is to say, hey, I want to prove something about the um, equivalence classes. So what you do is you pick a rep representative from each equivalence class, just randomly. And you prove that these, the things behave well enough with respect to these chosen elements. And that, but then you have a problem. And the problem is, what if you change the elements? Well, if you change the elements, you'd better get an equivalent answer. Maybe not equal on the nose, but it will be equivalent. So an example of this is modular arithmetic, mod two, say. So one plus one is equal to two, which is, e which is equivalent to zero modulo two. But so is three plus five, which is eight, which is also equivalent to zero modulo two, right? So this, you want to make sure that no matter how you choose your representatives, if they act together in a certain way, they'll produce an equivalent answer. So why, do, um, why did we go through this interlude on, on um, quotients? So you could imagine that the sets of ZFC are going to look like these sets and are quite large. So the, the sets of ZFC are going to look like um, unordered, um, unordered pure sets. So how do you build those? You just um, start with the empty set and you build new sets by taking, um, by either taking sets of sets that already exist or, so you essentially create a tree. It, 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 and the tree tells you the sets you make and that's about it. So a, you, you start with the empty set and then maybe you get the set that contains the empty set and then you get the set that contains the empty set and then the set that contains the set that contains the empty set and so on. So what you're doing is you're taking a bunch of empty bags and you're shoving them all into each other. That's sort of a, a picture of what you're doing. So, yeah, so, so 
These three things determine it completely. The empty set is a set. Any lists, list of sets defines a set whose elements are the entries of that set. And two sets are equal if and only if every ele ent element that's in one is an element of the other. Now, there you can have reorderings and duplicates, but that doesn't matter in this case. So notice what we did is we started with lists and coerced different lists to be equal by taking this equivalence relation on the collection of lists. And this is roughly the type of thing you would do. Now, um, I want to caution you when you get to infinite sets, there is um, some funniness because you have to do things like take the set of all sets and quotient that, but you can't really take the set of all sets because, well, there are ways in which that is self-contradictory. So all you do in that case is instead of the set of all sets, you take the class of all sets. But the story is mostly the same. You just have to watch out for those Russell type um, problems. So there do lie some dragons along the way that you have to watch for like that. Um, so here's another set theory. Any directed graph. Um, and how do you, what is your epsilon relation? Well, one node is contained in another if there is an arrow pointing from one to the other. You could reverse that, by the way, right? And that would be an epsilon relation too. And so, um, you say that one set is contained in the other if there is an edge. So, that's one version of it. And there's another way that you can make any directed graph into a set theory. This, is a, this one's a little bit different than the last one, though. Here, the sets are the same, they're the nodes. But the elements of the sets aren't other nodes, they're the edges themselves. So you can have sets which have parallel nodes. So, so you could have this set here it is contained in here in two different ways because you have the two different edges or you can even have loops and other such things. So both of these descriptions have their charms. The first one allows you to have sets that are contained in themselves and cycles and all kinds of weird things. The second one is interesting because um, I'm guessing nobody's here heard of category theory, right? <laughs> so. Anyway, the second one actually comes up in category theory quite a bit because you have, um, in that case, a category can be thought of as one of these directed edges and you think of the elements, the objects of the category as sets and the morphisms into the objects as, um, as its elements. So this is called generalized elements. Now. Um, I don't suppose any of you have heard of uh, Edward Komet, right? <laughs> nah, I, any, total unknown. Anyway, um, he had a, he put a thing on Twitter the other day that explains some of the history of this, how um, some people thought a, a branch of category theory in, called, called topos theory was about generalized sets and he was, he linked to this paper by Colin McClarty saying, well, no, not really, it comes from topology. So. I did want to mention that um, if you know a little bit of category theory, it's a, a pretty good read uh, on the history of things. Ah, so finally, we come to uh, ZFC itself. Yes? Which papers? The one you refer now. Um, See Edward Komet's Twitter feed. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, exactly. Thank you, Gershom. Um, so here is a ZFC or Zermelo Frankel set theory with choice. And this is actually, um, ZFC is sort of actually, um, not the best set theory to bring to a Haskell talk, in all honesty, because there's 
more Haskell-y set theories out there that are based on category theory. And this one is more of a, is more of a, um, a material set theory, where you care about how the, the underlying representations of things. So um, I like to think of um, things like uh, type theory and things like that as a high-level Haskell or an F-sharp or one of these, and maybe a Lisp or a scheme or even assembly as more like a, a set theory. So there is a sense in which ZFC is, is more of an assembly theory, an assembly language of math more than a, a high-level construct that you want to reason about. And there's reasons you'd want such a low-level description. So, okay, so let's get into the actual axioms that define ZFC. So, here's the reason for it. Well, it's the, um, it's this Russell set here. It's that we want to um, make a theory that is consistent and powerful enough and flexible enough to do almost all of mathematics. And that's the, uh, that is the um, desire. Excuse me. So, I already described the paradox. Um, if you want, I could describe it again, but if there's any desire, but I want to get to the axiom. What's that? So here's the axiom of the empty set. And it says there is a set with nothing in it, um, a void. Um, and you, you know, um, this sometimes isn't actually included as an axiom. I actually like to differ on this because there's a way in which it's actually cleaner. Um, a lot of, a lot of impl um, axiomizations of the same theory, of set theories, say there's minor differences between various um, axiomizations, but they're all roughly the same thing for, for most part. There's fine differences, but let's not worry about those. But some of them merely say there exists some set that has elements, and then you use other axioms to deduce the existence of an empty set. And the thing is, well, what happened? What, what is my problem with it is, well, what is the nature of this original set? Was it the empty set um, all along? Or does it have these phantom elements that are just sort of lying around and don't do anything and that you will never see or never hear from, but they're somehow hiding somewhere in your theory. And it's, it's philosophically messy, I think. And this, for me, really pins it down much more nicely to just say what you want, although there might be reasons to not do that that I'll get into. So, the axiom of the empty set. And here is comprehension. And so you all know about list comprehensions, right? Um, well, you have set comprehensions. And what this says is, so, so you remember our naive hope about the two ways of viewing sets, the, the random all kinds of stuff that just come from anywhere and you put it together in a bag, or this view of sets that have um, a cohesion and coherence and all have some property in common. Well, this is um, a limited version of that that is supposed to get you out of that problem of the set of all sets that don't contain themselves, right? So what this says is if you already have some set, then you have a proposition, a predicate. You can take all the elements of that set you already have and form the subset of just those elements that are um, contained in that set and satisfy the proposition. Um, I think we call this filter, right? That's exactly what you're doing. You're taking the set and you're filtering by the predicate. So, um, well, so, so that's um, one axiom, and 
it's uh, important. So, so the axiom of extensionality. So that's a fancy way of saying when two sets are equal. Now, a lot of treatments take this as an axiom. I kind of like it as a definition, actually, um, which says that um, what it says is it tells you when sets are equal. So one way is you take it as an axiom that equality is defined like this, or this is not defined, but this is equality. Um, because equality, the theory goes, is supposed to be this notion that's already included from the logical framework from above. And here you say what it means in your axiom system. Um, so, so what it says is that two sets are equal if and only if they contain the same elements. And if you read the quantifiers for every x and y, if for every z, z is an x, if and only if z is in y, this implies that x equals y. That's what that says in fancy uh, logic language. Um, and, but, I, but my view is you can take it as a definition and not lose any of the theory. You just have a definition and you show things are equal by the definition rather than by axiom. And you can have, still have a definition of axiom like, um, if you write down the same set with the same characters, well, that'll be equal. And you can start proving things like if you permute the elements, then their results will be equal. Yes? Can you talk about the difference between a definition and an axiom? Yeah. So a definition says, so, so it's actually a very uh, um, fine line in some ways. A definition says this is, so a definition is a sentence of the form X is and a description of what it is. An axiom, on the other hand, is some truth that comes up from above. So there exists um, a, a thing that, does, that has such and such a property. Now, that's not a definition. You're not defining something necessarily. You're saying that there is a thing, there may be many things, and you can get one from somewhere. Or you might, may, yes? You say that in definitions, you discover axioms. You, maybe. You, you, you can, you can, kind of think of it like that, but um, the truth is, is often the theorem is proven before you make the definition. And you make the definitions to suit the theorem, right? Or, you know, there's various ways you can move these pieces around to make them kind of mean what you want. So, so kind of, and, but be careful, right? So, so it, it's a pretty good rough intuition. Yes? This one. Um, yeah, it is. Um, so the reason this is the way the X, so, so the way I was uh, talking about this as a definition, it should be an if and only if. That's a, a good point. But in the way, if you think of it as an axiom, this is good enough because remember what I said before from the logical meta theory, um, if two things are equal, then they must, so, so that the other way will come from pure logic in other words. So, it, it dep so, so that is right or wrong depending on if, whether you're viewing it as an axiom or a definition, yes? Yeah, um, maybe. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. That's... So, here's um, another axiom, the axiom of pairing. And it says, if you happen to have two sets, you can form a new set which has as its elements those two sets. 
Now, there is some fine print to this. It does not say there is a set which contains precisely those two things. It merely says there is some set that has those two things. And by the way, there might be some other junk, right? And that's what the axiom says. But what if you really want the axiom, the, the set that has the two elements? Well, what you do is you use comprehension. You say there exists such a set that contains these two things. Now, a subset defined by the predicate that x is equal to one of the things in the pair or the other thing in the pair. And now your comprehension tells you you have the set with precisely the two elements because you take the subset that satisfies the proposition that it's one of the two things you started with. So this is um, a uh, some minor technicality that will um, come to again and again. And oftentimes in these theories, people will say there exists a set that has these things. And by the way, the fine print says if you want precisely those things, you're going to use comprehension to whittle off the bits you want. And the reason you do such a thing is simply that it gives you, well, when you're, um, so, so one thing you want to do is you make models of these theories in, well, you make models of these theories, whatever that means. I, I didn't want to say in sets because you find, it's a little complicated because you take another set theory with different properties and you find a set in that set theory which models this set theory. So let's just say you make models. And one way to make models is to show that your thing satisfies, um, satisfies these axioms. Well, if you merely have to show the existence of some set that contains the two things and might have some other junk, that may be a little bit easier than saying, uh, than making the precise set you want, right? Because you can get to it anyway in that case. So that's, you, you leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room in case you need it for some technical detail. That, that's kind of the story. But morally, it says there exists this precise set. Um, this, so, so what happens if the two things in the pair are equal? Well, that's the same as the singleton set, right? Because if you look at the singleton set and the set that contains x and x, well, they both contain the same exact elements, right? So that's an important special case. So I make a comment that this is similar to Kahn's when they're different and cons, the order matters. So not the same as cons. Ah, the axiom of union. So the axiom of union says that if you have a set and the set contains a bunch of other sets, then you can unionize all the sets. So let's say you have a very simple example, the set of things that are orange and the set of things are, that are green. And you form a new set. The two elements of the set are the orange set and the green set. And the axiom of union says you can take the elements of that set and unionize them together and you get all orange and green things. So here is the logical formula for it. Note again, the third bullet point of the whittling of the thing. You have some set that contains all the elements that are in at least one of the things, but you might have a little bit more. That's okay. But you can pull it down. Now this is similar to um, flatten, right? So, so flatten says in a list, you have a list, another list, another list, and you just flatten them all. Or um, Another way, um, concat, concat. Okay. Um, in fact, um, how to, that it, it is um, another way to say it is it's the um, multiplication of the monad. Although you'd have to rewrite that in terms of bind and return for you guys, but there's also this multiplication in has that monads have, and it's also the happens to be the multiplication of the monad that you get by. Rearranging the find and return, yes. Join is what we call it. Join, you call it a join. Ah. 
Okay, I join. Um, so here I define uh, subsets. So we say that one thing is a subset of the other. If for each element of x, it is an element of y. So it's just uh, the logical formula, and it says this. The axiom of the power set. So this says that if you have a set, you can take all of the subsets of that set and form that into a new set. So, for instance, if so, so here's um, a way of viewing this power set. Let's say you have a set of integers between 0 and 31, right? And you want all, you want the power set of um, the integers between 0 and 31. Well, the subsets are, you can think of them in some sense as um, all 32-bit integers in some sense. And the correspondence goes where you see a 1, you pick that index and you put it, put it in the set, right? So it's the old bit trick of uh, saying if you have um, a set of integers that is small, you can store that as um, a single integer by looking at the indices of things where, where, where the indices are 1s. So it's, um, that's a good uh, analogy. And this says that the set, set, this power set actually exists. And you can write code, by the way, to make this set for you. I don't recommend you'd ever run it beyond 20 or so. It gets really big. Um, so don't run the code for big numbers, but you can write it. Um, ah, so we have uh, some interlude. Um, maybe we should stop here for a few minutes for the interlude and we'll get on with it. Is that